Mark chapter 4. You know, we've seen in the first three chapters of the Gospel of Mark that who Jesus is has been very well established. Mark shares with us very clearly who Jesus is, that Jesus is the King, that Jesus is the Messiah, that Jesus is the Son of God. And Jesus is all about preaching that the kingdom of God, the rule, the reign, the authority of God, has arrived with his arrival, that it's finally come. The rule and reign of God have been spoken of, prophesied about, awaited for, for hundreds if not thousands of years. And at long last, with the arrival of Jesus, the Messiah, he would now establish his kingdom, the rule, the reign of God. But not as was expected. I mean, all those that were, would have been in that scene in the first century, they were anticipating on tiptoe for the arrival of this kingdom. But a kingdom that they thought would be political, maybe come in militaristically, or in any other way that could have been described as maybe of this world, right? A kingdom that they could see or, or touch or hear about or experience in some way. But the kingdom of God that Jesus spoke about came spiritually, the rule and reign in our hearts. And he's preaching and calling everyone to a, to a very simple message, but a very profound message. You find it there in verse 15 of chapter 1, repent of your sins and believe the good news. You see, over and over and again, throughout the first few chapters of Mark's gospel, I guess you could kind of picture Mark almost like an author who's got like his holsters right here, like a six shooter, and he's just firing off all the things that you see in the life of Jesus very rapidly giving evidence to who he is, that he's the king, that he's the Messiah, that he's the son of God. And like a quick shot with a, with a six shooter rapidly firing, he's showing us through these chapters that he's not just a rabbi that's come on the scene, but he has authority, authority over spiritual forces. 40 days he's in the wilderness. And the scene there is that he's in combat with the enemy and he comes out victoriously. He has power to cast out demons, Mark has showed us. He not only has authority over spiritual forces, but over physical frailty. I mean, you got a headache, Pete's mother-in-law, Jesus is there, right? Those with leprosy, Jesus can handle it. The blind, the paralytic, Jesus has authority spiritually, but also, also authority over physical frailty. He has authority and boldness with the elite of the culture. Maybe you remember from a few weeks ago that there was this political group known as the Herodians. What we know about the Pharisees, the priests, the Sadducees, when, when they would encounter Jesus, think of who he is. This guy from Nazareth, kind of a no-name town, a rabbi. But when he would encounter those who were of the elite in the culture, there was authority there in what he would share and what he would do. He had affirmation and approval from heaven itself at his baptism. This is my beloved son, and him I'm well pleased. I mean, as you read through the first three chapters, here's what I'm trying to say. I believe that who Jesus is by what he's done and the things that have surrounded him in Mark's gospel account in those very first three chapters, it's crystal clear. He's the king. He's the Messiah. He's the son of God. Well, now in chapter four, Mark kind of turns kind of his focus from, from the events that are surrounding Jesus, the things that Jesus is doing that are evidencing who Jesus is, he turns his focus from what Jesus is doing to the content of his teaching. Jesus most often taught in the form of a story. 
Jesus' stories were, they were entertaining for sure. And sometimes, though, they were even offensive to those who were really listening to what he had to say. But they enlightened those who were there, open, and seeking to see and hear and learn about what Jesus was really saying. And the teachings that we'll look at for the next couple of weeks here in Mark chapter 4, they focus on how the human heart responds to truth. Can I ask a question? How many among us in the room have a human heart? Okay, we got that physically. So this is the deal. What we're about to engage in over the next couple of weeks, this morning, we'll just look at one parable. Next Sunday, we'll dive into a couple. These are tailored, custom fit to where you are in this season of your life. It's going to speak about the attitude, the receptivity, the openness, the crowdedness, maybe, the distractedness, possibly, of your heart, of your heart. Not the arteries, not the clogs, not those kinds of things, but your sensitivity to God's spirit. You know, often in our culture today, what will be judged if you're in a time of listening to God's word is, well, how was the preacher? How did he do? What we'll learn this morning is that most often what's in question is, how is the listener? Is the person leaning in to what's being said from God's word? We'll see this morning in Mark chapter 4 that the focus is upon one's response to truth. Let's look at verse 1. Mark chapter 4. I'll read again once again from the New Living Translation. Here's what Mark records for us. Once again, Jesus began teaching by the lakeshore, and a very large crowd soon gathered around him. So he got into a boat, and he sat in the boat while all the people remained on the shore. Jesus isn't in the synagogue teaching by the lake shore, teaching out of a boat. And this is interesting on a, on a number of different levels. I mean, it seems like anytime he steps toe into a synagogue, there's controversy. So now he's out on a boat teaching. There's a very large crowd there, mixed company for sure. Some have heard about the healing. Maybe others are there for food. Some just like the stories. Maybe some just have a gnarly case of FOMO, right? Like fear of missing out. Something's going on. I want to be there. Others see a crowd, so they join in. Maybe some have never heard him teach, but they've heard about him. So they're there. And Mark tells us that as Jesus was teaching, he sat in the boat while all the other people remained on the shore. You know, the phenomenal thing about the Bible, the Bible is not a history book. It's not a book of archaeology or a book of science. But it is a book that is rooted in history, real places, historical places, with with accurate and factual evidence when it pertains to things of things like archaeology or science or history. You say, what do you mean? You see, this image on the screen kind of gives us a sense of the country that Jesus was in. The lake shore that Jesus would have been by that Mark's recording for us would undoubtedly been in the northern part of the country the Sea of Galilee, which in size is a bit more like a lake. That's why it says there in the New Living Translation, the lake shore. Now, admittedly, Mark doesn't specify right where this is along the lake shore, but most likely he's near Capernaum, where in that time, in fact, if you ever go to Israel, you could visit this area known as the Cove of the Sower. And this shot from the northeast is what the cove or the, the lake shore looks like today. This spot is known as the the Cove of the Sower. This is the traditional location for the place in the text that we're reading this morning. And this is an aerial shot where Jesus could easily be on the boat and the massive crowds could have gathered along the cove. And so if you were sitting there listening to Jesus speak, this could have been kind of the, the setting that you would have seen. Now, nobody left a marker. This is where Jesus spoke on this. No, nobody did that. But you can kind of get a sense from this traditional spot if you go to Israel and you can picture Jesus in a boat, speaking to a large crowd, teaching them, and his voice carrying over the water into the cove so that everyone could hear him clearly. 
And in verse 2, it says he taught them by telling many stories in the form of parables, such as this one, Mark writes. Now, before we look at the parable, here Mark tells us that Jesus taught them by telling stories. Stories. What kind of stories? Well, not illustrations, not fishing stories, not stories about his nieces and nephews. He could have very well had those. But he introduces us to a new word, at least for our reading in the Gospel of Mark as we're going through it. Mark says that Jesus taught using parables. Parables. The English word for parable, it kind of comes from two Greek words that means to cast alongside. So a parable, it's a story or it's a figure placed alongside a teaching to help us understand its meaning. Some have said that a parable is just simply a, an earthly story with a, with a heavenly meaning. And that is true. But here's the thing about Jesus' parables that are so important for you to grasp. The purpose of the parable was to get those who were listening deeply involved and, and almost compelled to make a decision about the truth that Jesus was sharing, a call to action. One author, when, when kind of commenting about Jesus' parables, said this, his parables were penetrating and personal. And after many heard them, especially the religious leaders, they would want to kill Jesus just by sharing a parable. So when you picture Jesus here in the boat with the crowds gathered along the lake shore, it, it, don't picture this, like he's sharing a story. It's a beautiful day in the night. No, that's not the kind of scene there. It's not a guy with maybe a soft-spoken but powerful perm painting a picture, you know, like a Bob Ross or something. It's not that. It's a beautiful scene, but it's not Mr. Rogers or Bob Ross coming to share a story. See, these parables, they begin very innocently with a picture or a scene that those listening, they would have easily said, oh man, I know exactly what he's talking about. I could step into this story. The parable would, would pique their interest, capture their attention. But if you're really listening, the parable would be a mirror or a window by which to see God and his truth and then offer an opportunity for what? The same thing that Jesus has been preaching all throughout the Gospel of Mark. For the kingdom of God, the rule and reign of God to come into your life. And so Jesus is there. Do you have the scene? Are you at the sower's cove? Can you picture yourself there? Your toes in the sand, so to speak. Jesus on the boat, sitting and speaking to these large crowds opening up with a story. And as he begins to speak, he's speaking to a group that most likely would have been illiterate. Not 90% of them possibly were agrarian, you know, peasant farmers. And so he says this in verse 3, listen, a farmer, a farmer went out to plant some seed. And you can imagine those in the crowd saying, I can relate to that. I just did that on Tuesday, right? Or maybe a father there sees his son and says, listen, the teacher, he's talking about your chores, right? This must be God's will for us. When we get home, let's get those seeds planted. Jesus is connecting with them. He sees this crowd and he shares a scene that would be very familiar to them. Let's read it. Verse four through verse nine. He says, this farmer, as he scattered it across his field, some of the seed, well, it fell on a footpath, and the birds came and ate it. Other seed fell on shallow soil with underlying rock, and the seed sprouted quickly because the, the soil was shallow. But the plant soon wilted under the hot sun. Since it didn't have deep roots, it died. Well, other seed fell among thorns that grew up and, and choked out the tender plants so they produced no grain. Still other seeds fell on fertile soil and they sprouted. They grew, produced a crop that was 30, 
60, even a hundred times as much has been planted. And then he said, anyone with ears to hear should listen and understand. That's church for the day. We'll see you next week. <laughs> I mean, that's the story. There's no like, turn back to Isaiah with me and Jeremiah and Ezekiel. And let, me, let me paint the picture of what I'm trying to say. There, there's no cute story at the beginning and three points that rhyme at the end to kind of help you remember it for the week. He's just saying, hey, you, you know, there's a farmer that goes out and casts seed. Yeah, we, we know that. Now, listen, as a 20th century human, say, what do you mean? Born in the 80s, but now living in the 21st century as a Christian, when I read this, or maybe as we read this this morning, there's maybe a lot of things that you wonder, but don't you kind of wonder, like, what's up with this farmer? I mean, in today's world, when I think of farming, I think of something like this, right? Like clean lines and rows, and we've got drones maybe to, to plant and to fertilize, and, and harvesting is maybe, a, a, it's done with kind of a symphony of man and machine producing massive crops. Now, obviously, during that time, it's not that sophisticated. But I've often wondered, what is up with this farmer? Why does he seem to be so wasteful? Why are there four different types of soil so close together? And the farmer, I mean, these are like 90% of the individuals here are illiterate. They're, they're part of an agrarian culture. They're, they're peasant farmers. Seed would have been very precious to them. Why is he so careless? with what is probably his livelihood. Now remember, this is a parable, not, not an actual account. It's not the purpose or design. And please catch this about a parable. It is not the purpose or design of a parable for every character, every element of the story to represent or mean something. Often parables have one singular point. Pop quiz, how many points do most parables often have? One. There's one point to the parable that Jesus is driving home. But I, I've often wondered and kind of had a hard picture or, you know, difficulty picturing what, what Jesus is describing. But for those who were there, these farmers, they could relate. Let me see if I can help us step into the story just through this image. This is a field, actually two fields in the area of Galilee. And the rocks here actually separate the fields. These rocky places, as Jesus references, have thorns near them. Why? Because a, for, a farmer naturally wouldn't till up the soil around the rocks, so thorns would grow near the rocks. To the left, you have the good soil, a footpath between the places of the thorns and the rocky places so that the farmer or the sower could scatter his seed. And this kind of fits the context of how the, the fields in that day and in that time would function. And Jesus describes this farmer as scattering his seed onto four soil types. So again, what's up with this farmer? There's no drones, nor did farmers kind of meticulously place each seed into a nice little row. But the farmer, he, he would grab a handful of seed and think of it like a sprinkler head. Right? Not a dance, you know, that whole thing. But, but like a sprinkler slinging his arm, spreading and casting the seed. So the seed would be sprayed all over these four areas. The good soil, the path, the thorns, and the rocky places. See, for those there on the, the lake shore, they get this, right? That's their Tuesday, so to speak. They know exactly what he's talking about. Everything up to this point that Jesus has said is a, like a, a scene taken right out of their daily lives. They've seen this story play out a dozen, if not hundreds of times before. But verse 8, verse 8, that's the point of the parable where, that starts to evidence that there's, there's something more that Jesus is saying here. There, there's, there's a spiritual teaching being placed alongside this very familiar story that most of these agrarian peasant farmers would have said, what? Verse 8, 
Still other seeds fell on fertile soil and they sprouted and grew. Okay, I get that, Jesus. And the crop, the crop produced 30, 60, even 100 times as much as been planted. What? 30, 60, 100? Not only is this a massive harvest, this is unrealistic. This doesn't happen. A farmer would have been overjoyed to have a crop that produced like tenfold. That would have been a banner year. So for those that were truly doing what Jesus asked them to do with the parable, can anyone remember in verse three what Jesus asked them to do? Starts with an L, ends with an N. Listen, Listen right? Listen. They would have recognized. This would have captured their attention, arrested their interest. That there's something that Jesus is saying here. That's why he says in verse 9, anyone with ears to hear should listen and understand. See, Jesus sets up his parable this way. He says, listen, gives the parable, whoever has ears to hear, let him hear. The word for listen, the idea of what Jesus means when he says, whoever has ears to hear, let them hear, he doesn't mean just please stay awake during the sermon. No, he's not saying that. That, that idea and that culture and that mindset, it would have been very much understood in this way. Hear Heed and obey. Can I say that again? Hear, heed, and obey. This is how Jesus is setting up the, the framework of this parable. Hear, obey this. Simple story. What? Obey this. I want to share this very clearly. What Jesus is saying here by listen and those that have ears to hear, to hear means to obey. That would have been very clearly understood in that culture. So let me put it in the NSS, Neil's short summary. Obey this. Here's the story. Obey this. Wow. So this is more than just some fishing illustrations that Jesus is giving with a little spiritual truth. He's calling them to action, to make a decision. So for those who are just there because they're following a crowd for the food, FOMO, wh whatever it is, it's possible that this familiar story would have just kind of rolled right off their backs, right? But for those who are listening, there's something that Jesus isn't saying that he is saying. So let's read on in verse 10. It says later, when Jesus was alone with the 12 disciples and with the others who were gathered around, they asked him what the parables meant. See, at this point, you're stepping into a scene that's much later. Jesus shares other parables. And so they're wondering about these. And, and the disciples, not just the 12, but all those who were kind of just hanging around Jesus that seemingly wanted to understand what he was saying, they're not getting it. And I want you to tune in specifically to these next three verses, because many have said that these are some of the hardest sayings of Jesus. They're one of the examples of the difficult things that Jesus says. If you read through Bible commentaries or look up things online to kind of help you understand more about the scriptures, you, you get some differing opinions on this and some of them just skip over it. Because look at what he says in verse 11. Jesus replies, you're permitted to understand the secret of the kingdom of God, he says. But I use parables for everything I say to the outsiders. Jesus tells his disciples and those hanging around, to those that are leaning in with a heart to listen, a heart to obey, he says, you'll understand the secret. Now, the Greek word for this, and this is important, that, that you understand this is not written necessarily in, you know, the NSS, Neil's short story version. This is written in the, the Aramaic Greek. The, the word for this is mysterion. Why is that important? It's where we get our English word mystery. 
It's not a secret like, here, don't tell anybody this. I've got a secret in my... No. It means that something that wasn't obvious before, like hidden from the prophets, is now becoming obvious because Jesus is revealing it. Does that make sense? Jesus is saying, listen, the mystery of the kingdom, that which was not really seen before, is now being revealed to you guys. Now, that's what he means by this phrase. And the secret, the, the mysterion, the mystery common to the kingdom parables of Jesus is simply this. That in Jesus, God's kingdom, his rule and his reign has come into human experience in a new way, a spiritual way. One author put it this way. The disciples had believed in Jesus and God had already given them this secret, though so far they understood little of its full impact. On the other hand, those blinded by unbelief saw in Jesus nothing but a threat to their existence. They rejected him and did not come to know the secret of God's kingdom. Jesus' parables served to conceal its truth from them. So if you were listening to Jesus, if you were open to what he had to say, if you were following that outline that he had for you, obey, listen, parable, obey, listen, you'd get it. But if not, go right over your head. That's why he says in verse 12, so that the scriptures might be fulfilled. And here he begins to quote from the book of Isaiah. When they see what I do, they will learn nothing. When they hear what I say, they will not understand. Otherwise, they will turn to me and be forgiven. Now, at first read, if you're anything like me, you might go, what? 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 But again, the key to text is context. Jesus is quoting from a passage from Isaiah. It's a larger section that he's quoting from. It's from chapter 6, verses 8 through 10 of Isaiah, where God is commissioning Isaiah to go and preach. Let me read it to you, just so you can, you can get a sense of what Jesus is saying. Isaiah 6 says this, I heard the Lord asking, whom shall I send as a messenger to these people? Who will go for us? Isaiah, here am I, send me. And he said, yes, go and say to these people, listen carefully, but do not understand. Watch closely, but learn nothing. Harden the hearts of these people, plug their ears and shut their eyes. That way they will not see with their eyes, nor hear with their ears, nor understand with their hearts and turn to me for healing. See, this is what God says to Isaiah to tell the people. And if you're anything like me, as you first read this, you go, great, now I'm even more confused. That doesn't help me at all, right? What is going on? God's playing game. I don't, what is going on? Now listen, clearly God is not asking his prophet to speak in a way that people wouldn't understand, nor speak so that they would be repelled by God. So what is going on? Well, this is a bit like shock therapy for the people in Isaiah's day. It's intended to shock and awaken them to the status of their hearts and into obedience. Let me see if I can illustrate it this way. This week, I spent four days and three nights. Is that right? Yes, four days and three nights. They were long nights. No, four days and three nights at home with my youngest children, Liam, Leo, and Lainey. See, don't you do that every night? Yes, I do. But my wife was out of town with our three eldest children. So I was on dad duty. And at this age, with like Liam and Leo, this will change. But I would say the boys are pretty easy. You know, you throw some food at them, put some clothes on them. If they smell too bad, you throw them in the water, and they're good, right? Four-year-old, seven-year-old, pretty easy, for the most part. Lainey Louise Pearl, she's another story. She has a strong will. Let me say that again. She has a strong will. Jesus had the sons of thunder. In our family, we've got their long-lost sister, right? That's Lainey Louise. But I learned something about Lainey this week. 
She does not, and she understands what it is, she does not like time out. I've learned that. So if she started to like maybe excessively, you know, whatever, disobey, maybe want, I just simply would say, are we ready to go to time out? And her face, like, how could you? <laughs> like, you would dare like, put me in time out? And this is what would happen. She would respond. The tears would kind of dry up a little bit. She'd kind of reacclimate to like sanity to a certain sense. And like, we would go ab about our day. Why do I share that? For the people in Isaiah's day, their hearts were so hard that what's happening is God is saying, do we need to go to time out? Like he's using hyperbole, provocation. He's trying to awaken them to listen. I, I want you to wake up, to, to hear and to obey. And Jesus' use of this quotation from Isaiah, his parable, it's meant to kind of have the same function. One author put it this way when he's describing what Jesus is doing. He said, when Jesus spoke his parables, he meant them to flash into men's minds and to illuminate the truth of God. But in so many eyes, he saw dull incomprehension, people blinded by prejudice, deafened by wishful thinking, or just too lazy to think. So he turned to his disciples and said to them, don't you remember what Isaiah once said? He said that when he came with God's message to God's people, Israel, in this day, they were so dully understanding that you would have thought that God had shut instead of opening their minds. I felt like that today. When Jesus said this, he did not say it in anger or irritation or bitterness or exasperation. He said it with the wistful longing of frustrated love, that poignant sorrow of a man who had a tremendous gift to give, which people were too blind to take. Jesus is there to reach people. John 3, 16, right? Like that's the message of the Bible. But he won't force himself on people. Their hearts have to be open. That's why he says what he says in verse 13. He says, listen, if you can't understand the meaning of this parable, how will you understand all the other parables? Then what does he mean by that? He's saying there's something to this parable, the one we just read, familiar scene for them of casting seed that has to do with the hearts of people. That's the crux of it all. That's what this is about, our you open. Are you listening? Not just listening, but hearing and obeying. Let me say this about this parable of Jesus. You know, we have four gospels in the New Testament. Almost 90% of what's in the gospel of John is unique to that gospel. The other three gospels are what are often referred to as the synoptic gospels. Well, we say, what does that mean? It means they, they share a very similar account of the life of Jesus because they see it from a very similar vantage point. And in each of those gospels, the synoptics, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, there are only three parables that are in all three accounts. And in each of those gospels, the very first parable is the one that is mentioned earliest is the parable of the sower and the seed. So why do I say that? In a sense, the meaning of this parable from Mark chapter four, it's like Jesus is saying, if you can't understand the meaning of this parable, how are you gonna get all the other ones? Because this is a, a parable about parables. If we don't get this, we're gonna struggle with all the rest. So he explains it. Look at verse 14. The farmer plants seed by taking God's word to others. Jesus explains very simply, the seed equals the word of God. Church, what does the seed equal? The word, of, the word of God. God's truth to us. Yes, absolutely, emphatically, that includes the life, death, burial, resurrection, ascension, and the return of Jesus, the gospel. Most definitely does the seed represent the good news about Jesus. But also, it's, it's very simply God's truth. His word being spoken to us collectively, 
or individually. This parable could be more appropriately called the parable of the soils, because that's really what it's about. So in verse 15, Jesus says, the seed that fell on the footpath, well, it represents those who hear the message only to have Satan come at once and take it away. The first of the four soils, soil representing the condition of a human heart, is the footpath, or what's often called the hard heart. The seed, the Word of God, seemingly makes no impact on hard path people. This isn't a rhetorical question. Let me see if you can get the answer to this. Is it the fault of the seed? No. no. Just as in the days of Isaiah, just as in the days of Jesus, just as in every day, the hearts of some people are hard. It's not that the word has lost its effect, but that the word of God does not take root where it's not welcome. So Jesus says, Satan, like the birds of verse 4, easily comes at once and just takes it away. Maybe those who have hard heart, they don't feel any need, no desire for anything other than what life has to offer. No sense of guilt, no need of forgiveness. One author put it this way, Satan has no trouble with these people. This is a reality to remember. In taking in the word of God, in sharing the gospel, there is a real enemy who seeks to cast doubt, despair, and disbelief. What's the remedy for a hard heart? Well, if you were asking a farmer, how do we fix some hard soil? Got to plow it up, right? Warren Wiersbe says this, hard hearts must be plowed before they can receive the seed. And this can be a very painful experience. You know, on Wednesday night, we had a prayer gathering together here as, as a church. And we had six different guys from within the congregation kind of lead us through a time of focused prayer where we prayed for the, the businesses in our local community, prayed for the families, the relationships between the, the parents and children, the husbands and wives, prayed for our local government, prayed for our schools, prayed for our local church, prayed for those who don't yet know the Lord. And one of the guys leading us in prayer said something that was very insightful. He said that he and his wife had been praying for months, for months, for their son who was very far from God. He said they would have sleepless nights, but their son would be just one room away, sleeping away, but far from God. And he said something. He said, but then it happened. My son's heart was crushed and open to God. You see, the attitude or the condition of one's heart is often the governor of their response to the word of God. The sower goes out to sow, and some seed falls on a path that is hard trodden. So the birds come quickly and take it away. Is it impossible for a hard soiled heart to be softened? No, it's not impossible. God can do anything, He can do anything. He can crush a heart. He can open a heart. He can plow up that heart. But don't think that if you've ever shared God's word or, or shared the good news about Jesus or just let your life story be an example to a friend, a family, a loved one, and they don't respond, that in some way I've failed. See, God loves people enough to give everything for them, but not to force himself upon them. The sower goes out to sow. Some of the seed fell on a hard heart. So Jesus goes on to explain the second soil, the condition of the human heart. Verse 16, the seed on the rocky soil, he says, 
represents those who hear the message and immediately they, they, they receive it with joy. But since they don't have deep roots, they don't last long. They fall away as soon as they have problems or are persecuted for believing God's word. The rocky soil, the second of these four, are, are those who maybe hear the message and receive it and are even excited about it. I mean, it's God's word, God's will, and it's good. Listen to how the Apostle John describes God's word and will. He puts it in this way. It's from 1 John 5. He said, everyone who believes that Jesus Christ, that he is the Christ, has become a child of God. And everyone who loves the Father loves his children too. We know we love God's children if we love God and obey his commandments. Look at verse 3. Loving God means keeping his commandments. And his commandments are a bummer. No, we know that loving God is keeping his commandments and his commandments are not burdensome. The, the soil that falls on that rocky heart, they, they learn about God. They, they come to know what he's really commanding of them and they go, this is good. This isn't burdensome. I like this. The apostle Paul put it this way in Romans 12 too, that it's the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. That the will of God for your life is not anything other than that. Jesus, he puts it this way, John chapter 10. I am the gate. Those who come in through me will be saved. They will come and go freely and will find good pastures. The thief's purpose is to steal, kill, and destroy, but my purpose is to give them a rich and satisfying life. I mean, this is good stuff. The seed that goes out that falls on this rocky, they hear this and go, sign me up. I want the will of God. I, I want to go through the gate. I want that rich and satisfying life that God has. I want those commandments that are not burdensome. There's a response to the Lord, and it's a good response. And that heart that is right, it shows a little bit of growth. But here's the reality, church. Trouble inevitably comes into all of our lives. The, the rain, the blessing that falls on the just and the unjust, the Bible says. The flip side of that is drought falls on the just and the unjust. Difficult times come. And for being a Christian, following Jesus doesn't necessarily mean that things in your life just ultimately open up and become rainbows and roses. No, you can be targeted from the enemy because you belong to God. You know, there's a um, popular English proverb that says, when the going gets tough, the tough get going, right? Well, it's like Jesus is saying, when the going gets tough, they gone. Like, that's what he's saying here. For the rocky, soiled heart. Why is that? Jesus gives a very insightful explanation. There's no root. The New King James puts it this way. There's no root in themselves. I like how Pastor David Guzik explains this. He says, some professing Christians have no root in themselves. What that means is their root is in their parents or in their Christian friends or in their pastor or in some kind of enthusiastic surrounding. And then he quotes from Charles Spurgeon and says there, then there are many more whose religion must be sustained by enthusiastic surroundings. They seem to have been baptized in boiling water. And unless the temperature around them is kept up to that point, they wither away. The religion that is born of mere excitement will die when the excitement is over. There's this sense that, that Jesus, my identity is in you. It's in you. I am who you say that I am. My root goes in to you. Not just my surroundings, not just my community, not just my leadership, not just my family. Those are all good things. But I find my root in you. That, that's the soil, that's the heart, that's the response that you want. 
We're almost finished. Look at verse 18. We'll see the third of the four soils explained. He says, the seed that fell among thorns represents others who, who hear God's word, but all too quickly. The message is crowded out by the worries of this life, the lure of wealth, and the desire for other things. So no fruit is produced. Life is full of distractions and can be full of conflict. If we're not careful, the distractions, the challenges can replace and begin to choke out the fruit that the seed of the word of God is intended to give. The seed takes root, but thorns begin to grow. And thorns, they steal, they stunt, they rob. Listen to how Jesus describes the thorns, cares of this life. Anyone have cares in this life? Bunch of thorny hearted people. No, I mean, <laughs> we all have this, right? We have this. The allure of wealth. Does anyone not want? I mean, we won't go, but I mean, these are not necessarily like, gosh, that's, these are things that we all experience is what I'm trying to say. Thorns, they, they're going to come into all of our lives. But they begin to crowd. They begin to take the place where the seed is meant to be supreme. One author put it this way, we may say that this ground is too fertile. The word of God grows there, but so does everything else. And soon everything else seems to become what crowds out the word of God. And the fourth and final condition is this in verse 20. He says, the seed that fell on good soil, it represents those who hear and accept God's word. and produce a harvest of 30, 60, even 100 times as much as had been planted. This is the crescendo of Jesus' parable. It's the heart you want. It's a heart that reflects one that truly belongs to God, one that listens and follows, one who listens and obeys, one who hears and accepts. That's where the harvest is. It's where the fruit is produced. Jesus said this in John 15, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for apart from me you can do nothing. Jesus' half-brother put it this way, don't just listen to God's word, but do what it says. Otherwise, you're only fooling yourselves. See, as we close this morning, let me say this. I don't believe that the soils of the heart are simply just a one-time thing or a lifelong condition. Amen. So what do you mean? You say, well, I'm just a footpath guy, hard-hearted. When it comes to meeting and greeting in church, I don't do that. That's not my thing. Or I'm just thorny, right? I got the cares of this world. Or, or I'm the good soil, always. I'm a Christian, so that, means, that must mean what that is. I've always got good soil in my heart. See, I don't believe that these conditions of the heart, these soils that Jesus is giving a parable about, just represent the heart condition before coming to Jesus. They most definitely do. Most definitely do. Represent a heart. But also as we walk with Jesus, to have the soil of a heart that produces, that genuinely belongs to him, Listen, if I can have your attention, I believe we have the responsibility to ask, are there any rocks or thorns in my life that need to be tilled up? We may know right offhand what those are. Others may need to be revealed to us by God or maybe by others. But here's the interesting thing that a farmer knows about rocks, especially in that kind of area of the world. You can remove the rocks in your soil, and years later, rocks can come again. They can surface over time. As God's word goes forth into your life, honestly ask, am I listening? See what, please remember what listen means. 
the word and idea for what Jesus says when he says, whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. It means to hear, to heed, to, oh, what, church? Amen. Obey. I want to be very clear on this. To listen is to obey, to follow Jesus. That old phrase, he's not looking for fans. He's looking for followers. And here's the, the crux of the parable. OK, Lord, as I trust and obey, I experience the kingdom of God in my life. Is that burdensome? <laughs> That's the good, the perfect, the acceptable will of God. See, the heart can be the very central facet of who you are. Proverbs 4.23, guard your heart with all diligence, for out of it spring the issues of life. To have good soil, don't harden your heart. Remember Revelation 2 and 3, Jesus speaking to the church, whoever has ears to hear. Let me just put this little summary up on the screen as we close this morning. This is another person's words. But if you're like, man, I don't know what Jesus is saying. I think this person nailed it. He said, to summarize the point of the parable, a man's reception of God's word is determined by the condition of his heart. A second lesson would be salvation is more than superficial, albeit joyful hearing of the gospel. Someone who is truly saved will simply go on to prove it. May our faith and lives exemplify good soil in the parable of the sower. Having a heart that is just simply open to God and I don't think that this is just a one-time thing. Man, I prayed the prayer. My heart's open. I think it's something you kind of go, Lord, how's my dirt today, right? <laughs> That's kind of a daily question to ask. Lord, are there thorns? Are there rocks surfacing? If you're human, can I just give you the answer to that? Yes. Yes, they are there. Yes. Welcome to all of our experience. So, Lord, do some plowing. Do, do some tilling. And can I encourage you, do that within the context of a personal relationship with the Lord and do that in the context of a community relationship with his church. That's the, the, uh, the take to and call me in the morning from the scripture, so to speak, of how you handle that. You have a personal relationship with the Lord where that root, it's not in your community, it's not in your pastor, it's not in where you come from. You have a relationship with Jesus. And also... You're connected in community. And you just keep this heart that is soft before him. 